I call upon Mohamed Yunus to give the 2006 Nobel Lecture on behalf of himself and Grameen Bank, please. Your Majesties, Your Royal Highnesses, Honourable Members of the Norwegian Nobel Committee, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen. Amake abong Gramin Banke Nobel Shanti Purushka Die Shammani Tokorai, Ami Norwegian Nobel Committee ke Bangladesh, Shokol, Manushet, Pokoteke, Antorik, Donobad, O Krito Gota Janati. Bangladesh, Bangladesh, Manush, Poristram, Shongram, Abong Shot, Bangladesh, Mohilada, Nijedir, Shongshari, Unutianar Jono, Dura Potigo. A Moha Shoman Tadirke Bipul Babe Ujipito Kurbe. Bangladesh Torun Gusti Sizon Shil. Bisho Gan Obigotar Bandare Aro Bohu Abodan Rakar Jono E Purushkar Tadirke Bishon Babe Unuprani to Kuretse. Tayap Nadirke Oshesh Donova Janatsi. Deshobashi Bhayo Bonera Apnade Doa O Shubetchani Amra Oslo Eshetsi Ami Abong Rashahir Pirigatsi Gramir Toslima Begum Apnade Shokole Pokoteke Kichukon Age Nobel Shanti Purskar Grohon Kolam Ashun Shobai Mile Muni Shobu Chash Ujar Kore Jore Hatalidi E Purskarke Boron Koreni A Purushkar Power Goro, Amade Jatike, Protinio to Aro Odikotor, Goro Ber Potenia Jack, Cholun Amra Shabai, E. Kamonakuri, Abong Ejono Nijede, New Jetokori. Gramin Bank and I are deeply honored to receive this most prestigious of all awards. We are thrilled and overwhelmed by this honor. Since the Nobel Peace Prize was announced, I have received endless messages from around the world. But what, moves, what moved me most are the calls that I get almost daily from the borrowers of Grameen Bank in remote Bangladeshi villages who just want to say how proud they are to have received this recognition. Nine elected representatives of the seven million borrower come owners of Grameen Bank have accompanied me all the way to Oslo to receive the prize. And Taslima is representing her, representing them. I expressed thanks on their behalf to the Norwegian Nobel Committee for choosing Grameen Bank for this year's Nobel Peace Prize. By giving their institution the most prestigious prize in the world, you give them unparalleled honor. Thanks to your prize, nine proud women from the villages of Bangladesh are at the ceremony today as Nobel laureates, giving an altogether new meaning to the Nobel Peace Prize. All borrowers of Grameen Bank are celebrating this day as the greatest day of their lives. They are gathering around the nearest television set in their villages all over Bangladesh, along with the other villagers, to watch the proceedings of this ceremony. This year's prize gives the highest honor and dignity to the hundreds of millions of women all around the world who struggle every day to make a living and bring hope 
for better life for their children. This is a historic moment for all of them. By giving this prize, the Norwegian Nobel Committee has given important support to the proposition that peace is inextricably linked to poverty. Poverty is a threat to peace. World's income distribution gives a very telling story. 94% of the world income goes to 40% of the world population, while 60% of the people live only with 6% of the world income. Half of the world population lives on $2 a day. The millennium began with a great global dream. World leaders gathered at the United Nations in 2000 and adopted, among others, historic goal to reduce poverty by half by 2015. Never in human history had such a bold goal have been adopted by the entire world in one voice, one that specified time and size. But then came September 11 and the Iraq war, and suddenly the world became derailed from the pursuit of this dream, with the attention of the world leaders shifting from the war on poverty to the war on terrorism. Till now, over, uh, over $530 billion has been spent on the war in Iraq by the USA alone. I believe terrorism cannot be won by the military action. Terrorism must be condemned in the strongest possible language. We must stand solidly against it and find all the means to end it. We must address the root cause of terrorism to end terrorism for all time to come. I believe that putting resources into improving the lives of the poor is a better strategy than spending it on guns. <laughs> Peace should be understood in a human way in a broad social, political, and economic way. Peace is threatened by unjust economic, social, and political order, absence of democracy, environmental degradation, and absence of human rights. Poverty is the absence of all human rights. The frustrations, hostility, and anger generated by abject poverty cannot sustain peace in any society. For building stable peace, we must find ways to provide opportunities for people to live decent lives. The creation of opportunities for the majority of the people, the poor, is at the heart of the work that we have dedicated ourselves during the past 30 years. I became involved in poverty issue not as a policymaker or as a researcher. I became involved because poverty was all around me, and I could not turn away from it. In 1974, I found it difficult to teach elegant theories of economics in the university classroom, in the backdrop of a terrible famine that was raging in Bangladesh. Suddenly, I felt the emptiness of all those theories in the face of the crushing hunger and poverty. I wanted to do something immediate to help people around me, even if it was just one human being, to get through another day with a little more ease. That brought me face to face with poor people's struggle to find tiniest amounts of money to support their efforts to eke out a living. I was shocked to discover a woman in the village borrowing less than a dollar from the moneylender on the condition that he would have the exclusive right to buy all she produces at the price that he decides. This, to me, was a way of recruiting slave labor. I decided to make a list of the victims of the money lending in the village next door to the campus. When my list was complete, I had names of 42 victims who borrowed a total amount of $27. 
I was shocked. I offered this $27 from my own pocket to get these victims out of the clutches of the moneylenders. The excitement that was created among the people by this action got me further involved in it. If I could make so many people so happy with such a tiny amount of money, why shouldn't I do more of it? That's what I have been trying to do ever since. The first thing I did was try to persuade the bank located in the campus to lend money to the poor, but that didn't work. They didn't agree. The bank said that the poor are not creditworthy. After all my efforts for several months, when it failed, I offered to become a guarantor for the loans to the poor. When I gave the loans, I was stunned by the result it, I got. The poor paid back their loans on time, every time. But still, I kept confronting difficulties in expanding the program to the existing banks. That was when I decided to create a separate bank for the poor. I finally succeeded in doing that in 1983. I named it Grameen Bank or Village Bank. Today, Gamin Bank gives loans to nearly 7 million poor people. 97% of them are women. In 73,000 villages of Bangladesh, Gamin Bank gives collateral free income generating loans, housing loans, student loans, and microenterprise loans to the poor families and offers them a host of attractive savings, pension funds, and insurance products for its members. Since it, introduced, since it introduced them in 1984, housing loans have, become, have been used to construct 640,000 houses. The legal ownership of these houses belongs to the women themselves. We focused on women because we found giving loans to women always brought more benefits to the family. In a cumulative way, the bank has given out a loan totaling about $6 billion, repayment rate 99%. Grameen Bank routinely makes profit. Financially, it is self-reliant and has not taken donor money since 1995. Deposits and own resources of Grameen Bank today amount to 143% of all the outstanding loans. According to Grameen Bank's internal survey, 58% of our borrowers have crossed the poverty line. Grameen Bank was born as a tiny homegrown project run with the help of several of my students, all local girls and boys. Three of these students are still with me in Grameen Bank after all these years as its topmost executives. They are here today to receive this honor you gave us. This idea, which began in Jobra, a small village in Bangladesh, has spread around the world. There are now Grameen type programs in almost every country in the world. It is 30 years now since we began. We keep looking at the children of our borrowers to see what has been the impact of our work on their lives. The women who are our borrowers always gave topmost priority to the children. One of the 16 decisions developed and followed by them are to send children to school. Grameen Bank encouraged them, and therefore, and before long, all the children were going to school. Many of these children made it to the top of their classes. We wanted to celebrate that, so we introduced scholarships for talented students. Grameen Bank now gives 30,000 scholarships every year. Many of these children went to the higher education to become doctors, engineers, college teachers, and other professionals. We introduced student loans to make it easy for Grameen students to complete their higher education. Now, some of them have even PhDs. There are 13,000 students on the student loans. Over 7,000 students are added to this number annually. 
we are creating a completely new generation that will be well equipped to take their families way out of the reach of poverty. We want to make a break in the historical continuation of poverty. In Bangladesh, 80% of the poor families have been reached with microcredit. We are hoping that by 2010, all 100% of the poor families will be reached with microcredit. Three years ago, we started an exclusive program focusing on the beggars. None of Grameen Bank's rules apply to them. Loans are interest-free. They can pay whatever amount they wish, whenever they wish. We gave them the idea to carry small merchandise, such as snacks, toys for the kids, or household items for the housewives when they go from house to house for begging. The idea worked. There are now 85,000 beggars in the program. About 5,000 of them have already stopped begging completely. They are now house to house salesperson rather than house to house beggars. Typical loan to a beggar is only $12. We encourage and support every conceivable effective intervention to help poor fight out of poverty. We always advocate microcredit in addition to all other interventions, arguing that microcredit makes all other interventions work better. Information and communication technology is quickly changing the world, creating distanceless, borderless world of instantaneous communications. Increasingly, it is becoming less and less costly. I saw an opportunity for the poor people to change their lives if this technology could be brought to them to meet their needs. As a first step to bring information technology to the poor, we created a mobile phone company, Grameen Phone. We gave loans from Grameen Bank to the poor women to buy mobile phones to sell phone services in the villages. We saw the synergy between microcredit and information technology. The phone business was a success, was a roaring success, and became a coveted enterprise for Grameen borrowers. Telephone ladies, as they are called, learned and innovated the ropes of the telephone business. And it has become the quickest way to get out of poverty and to earn social respectability. Today, there are nearly 300,000 telephone ladies providing telephone service in all the villages of Bangladesh. Grameen Phone has more than 10 million subscribers and is the largest mobile phone company in the country. Although the number of telephone ladies is only a small fraction of the total number of subscribers, but they, the telephone ladies, generate 19% of the revenue of the company. Out of the nine board members who are present here today, Four of them are telephone ladies. <laughs> Grameen Phone is a joint venture company owned by Telenor of Norway and Grameen Telecom of Bangladesh. Telenor owns 62% share of the company. Grameen Telecom owns 38%. Our vision was to ultimately convert this company into a social business by giving majority ownership to the poor women of Grameen Bank. We are working towards that goal. Someday, Grameen Phone will become another example of a big enterprise owned by poor women. Capitalism centers around free market. It is claimed that the freer the market, the better is the result of capitalism in solving the questions of what, how, and for whom. It is also claimed that the individual search for personal gains brings collective optimal result. I am in favor of strengthening the, strengthening the freedom of the market. At the same time, I am very unhappy about the conceptual restrictions imposed on the players in the market. This originates from the assumption that entrepreneurs are one-dimensional human beings who are dedicated to one mission in their business life. 
to maximize profit. This interpretation of capitalism insulates the entrepreneurs from all political, emotional, social, spiritual, environmental dimensions of their lives. This was done perhaps as a reasonable simplification, but it stripped away the very essence of human life. Human beings are a wonderful creation embodied with limitless human qualities and capabilities. Our theoretical constructs should make room for the blossoming of those qualities, not assume them away. Many of the world's problems exist today because of this restriction on the players at the free market. The world has not resolved the problem of crushing poverty that half of its population suffers. Healthcare remains out of the reach of the majority of the world population. We have remained so impressed by the success of the free market that we never dared to express any doubt about this basic assumption. To make it worse, we worked extra hard to transform ourselves as closely as possible into the one-dimensional human beings as conceptualized in the theory to allow smooth functioning of the free market mechanism. By defining entrepreneur in a broader way, we can change the character of capitalism radically and solve many of the unresolved social and economic problems within the scope of the free market. Let us suppose an entrepreneur, instead of having a single source of motivation, such as maximizing profit, now has two sources of motivation, which are mutually exclusive, but equally compelling. One, maximization of profit, another, doing good to people and to the world. Each type of motivation will lead to a separate kind of business. Let us call the first type of business as a profit-maximizing business, and the second type of business as social business. Social business will be a new kind of business introduced in the marketplace with the objective of making difference to the world. Investors in social business could get back their investment money, but will not take any dividend from the company. Profit would be plowed back into the company to expand its outreach and improve the quality of the product or the service. A social business will be a non-loss, non-dividend company. Once social business is recognized in law, many existing companies will come forward to create social businesses in addition to their foundation activities. Many activists from the non-profit sector will also find this as an attractive option. Unlike the nonprofit sector, where one needs to collect donations to keep activities going, a social business will be self-sustaining and create surplus for expansion, since it is a non-loss enterprise. Social business will go into a new type of capital market of its own to raise capital. Young people all around the world, particularly in rich countries, will find the concept of social business very appealing since it will give them a challenge to make a difference by using the, their creative talents. Many young people today feel frustrated because they cannot see any worthy challenge which excites them within the present capitalist system. Socialism gave them a dream to fight for. Young people dream about creating a perfect world of their own. Almost all social and economic problems of the world will be addressed through the social businesses. The challenge is to innovate business models and apply them to produce desired results cost-effectively and efficiently, such as healthcare for the poor could be a social business, financial services for the poor, information technology for the poor, education and training for the poor, marketing for the poor, renewable energy. These are all exciting ideas for social businesses. Social business is important because it addresses very vital concerns of mankind. It can change the lives of the bottom 60% of the world population and help them get out of poverty. Even profit-maximizing companies can, can be designed as social businesses by giving full or majority ownership to the poor. This constitutes a second type of social business. Grameen Bank falls under this category of social business. It is owned by the poor. 
The poor get the shares of these companies as gifts by the donors, or they could buy the shares with their own money. The borrowers, with borrowers of Grameen Bank buy the shares of Grameen Bank with their own money, and these shares cannot be transferred to non-borrowers. A, com a committed professional team does the day-to-day -day running of Grameen Bank. Bilateral and multilateral donors could easily create this type of social business. When a donor gives a loan or a grant to build a bridge in a recipient country, it could create instead a bridge company owned by the local poor. A committed management company could be given the responsibility of running that company. Profit of the company will go to the local poor as dividend and towards building more bridges. Many infrastructure projects like roads, highways, airports, seaports, utility companies could all be built in this manner. Grameen has created two social businesses of the first kind. One is the yogurt factory to produce fortified yogurt to bring nutrition to malnourished children of Bangladesh. This is a joint venture with Danone. It will continue to expand until all malnourished children of Bangladesh are reached with fortified yogurt. Another is a chain of eye care hospitals. Each hospital will undertake on an average of 10,000 cataract surgeries per year at differentiated prices to the rich and the poor. To connect the investors with social businesses, we need to create social stock market where only the shares of the social businesses will be traded. An investor will come to this stock market with a clear intention of finding a social business which has a mission of his liking or her liking. Anyone who wants to make money will go to the existing stock market. To enable social stock exchange to perform properly, we will need to create rating agencies, standardization of terminology, definitions, impact measurement tools, reporting formats, and new financial publications, such as the Social Wall Street Journal. Business schools will offer courses and business management degrees on social businesses to train young managers how to manage social business enterprises in the most efficient manner, and most of all, to inspire them to become social business entrepreneurs themselves. I support globalization and believe it can bring more benefits to the poor than it's any alternative. But it must be the right kind of globalization. To me, globalization is like a hundred-lane highway crisscrossing the world. If it is free-for-all highway, its lanes will be taken over by the giant trucks from powerful economies. Bangladeshi rickshaws will be thrown off the highway. In order to have a win-win globalization, we must have traffic rules, traffic police, and traffic authority for this global highway. Rule of strongest take it all must be replaced by rules that will ensure that the poorest have place and peace of action without being elbowed out by the strong. Globalization must not become financial imperialism. Powerful multinational social businesses can be created to retain the benefit of globalization for the poor people and poor countries. Social business will either bring ownership to the poor people or keep the profit within the poor countries since taking dividends will not be the objective of the social business. Direct foreign investment by foreign social businesses will be exciting news for recipient countries. Building strong economies in the poor countries by protecting their national interest from plundering companies will be a major area of interest of the social businesses. We get what we want or what we don't refuse. We accept the fact we will always have poor people around us and that poverty is a part of human destiny. This is precisely why we continue to have poor people around us. If we firmly believed that poverty is unacceptable to us and that it should not belong to, the, to a civilized human society, we would have built appropriate institutions and policies to create a poverty-free world. We wanted to go to the moon, so we went there. We achieve what we want to achieve. 
If we are not achieving something, it is because we have not put our minds to it. We create what we want. What we want and how we get to it depends on our mindsets. It is extremely difficult to change our mindsets once it is formed. We create the world in accordance with our mindsets. We need to invent ways to change our minds, uh, uh, our uh, perspective continually re and reconfigure our mindset quickly as new knowledge emerges. We can reconfigure our world if we can reconfigure our mindset. I believe that we can create a poverty-free world because poverty is not created by poor people. It has been created and sustained by the economic and social system that we have designed for ourselves, the institutions and concepts that make up the system, the policies that we pursue. Poverty is created because we built our theoretical framework on assumptions which underestimates human capacity. By designing concepts which are too narrow, such as the concept of business, concept of creditworthiness, concept of entrepreneurship and employment. Or, or by developing institutions which remain half done, such as financial institutions, where poor are left out. Poverty is, ca ca is caused by failure, of the conceptual, failure at the conceptual level, rather than any lack of capability on the part of the people. I firmly believe that we can create a poverty-free world if we collectively believe in it. In a poverty-free world, the only place you would be able to see poverty is in the poverty museums. When school children will take a tour of the poverty museums, they would be horrified to see the misery and the indignity that human beings had to go through they would blame their forefathers for tolerating this inhuman condition which existed for so long and for so many people. A human being is born, with, born into this world fully equipped not only to take care of himself or herself, but also to contribute to enlarging the well-being of the world as a whole. Some get a chance to explore the potential that, is, that it ha they have in themselves, but many others never get an opportunity during their lifetime to unwrap the wonderful gift that they were born with. They die unexplored, and the world remains deprived of their capacity and their contribution. Grameen has given me an unshakable faith in the creativity of human beings. This has led me to believe that human beings are not born to suffer the misery of hunger and poverty. To me, poor people are like bonsai trees. When you plant the best seed of the tallest tree in a flower pot, you get a replica of the tallest tree, only inches tall. There is nothing wrong with the seed you planted, only the soil base that is given to it is too inadequate. Poor people are bonsai people. There is nothing wrong in their seeds. Simply, society never gave them the base to grow on. All it needs to get the poor people out of poverty for us to create an enabling environment for them. Once the poor can unleash their energy and creativity, poverty will disappear very quickly. Let us join hands to give every human being a fair chance to unleash his or her energy and creativity. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by expressing my deep gratitude to the Norwegian Nobel Committee for recognizing the poor people and their strength, especially the poor women. Have both the potential and the right to live a decent life, and microcredit helps to unleash that potential. I believe that this honor that you give us will inspire many more bold initiatives around the world to make a historical breakthrough in ending global poverty. Deshobashi bhaiyo bonera, apna der shabai ke shudur oslo teke amar bhalo vasha 
এবং সালাম জানিয়ে আমার বক্তৃতা শেষ করছি থ্যাংক ইউ ভেরি মাচ লেডিস এন্ড জেন্টলম্যান থ্যাংক ইউ ফর গিভিং ইয়োর কাইন্ড অ্যাটেনশন থ্যাংক ইউ ভেরি মাচ